Hello, everyone. I'm Tricia Edwards, Deputy Director of Smithsonian Affiliations, and I'm so glad to have you all with us today. We're delighted to have you here for our program, Michael Jordan, a reevaluation about the basketball legend and his cultural legacy. I know it's going to be an interesting, thought provoking and timely discussion. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, we want to let you know that this program is being recorded and everyone has been muted to avoid background noise and feedback. So if you have comments, please use the chat box. If you have questions for our presenter, please enter those in the Q&A box. You should be able to find both the chat and the Q&A in the toolbar either at the top or the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're making a comment in the chat box, please make sure that you click onto all panelists and attendees, and that way everyone will be able to see the comments that you're making. Um, if you send it just to panelists, um, only the people like me and the rest of the affiliations team will be able to see. And we really hope that we'll be able to have a dialogue, um, not only with us on, on the presenter side, but with all of our community with us today. Um, our staff will be monitoring both the chat um, and we'll respond um, as needed. Um, closed captioning is available for this program. Just click the closed caption button on your screen and captions will appear. You should find the closed caption button in that same toolbar at the top or the bottom of your screen. If you have a technical issue or a question unrelated to today's discussion, please use the raise your hand feature or type it in the chat box and a Smithsonian staff member will assist you. Um, Smithsonian Affiliations is pleased to host today's program in collaboration with our National Museum of African American History and Culture, and especially to have Dr. Damian Thomas, the museum's curator of sports, as our featured speaker. We also welcome 10 Smithsonian affiliate partners um, who are help making today's program possible. At Smithsonian Affiliations, we partner with museums and cultural organizations across the country to support their needs and those of their communities, people like you, while also furthering the Smithsonian's mission to increase and diffusion of knowledge. Like the Smithsonian, our 200 plus affiliate partners are committed to education and public service and work in collaboration with the Smithsonian to catalyze critical conversations in their communities, introduce issues of historic and contemporary importance, and help us all to better understand the world around us. Today's program is a great example of the ways in which the Smithsonian and our affiliates work together to bring thought provoking and relevant content to audiences like the one we have with us today. With the help of 10 affiliate organizations across the country, we're able to bring the Smithsonian quite literally to your living rooms. We offer special thanks to the California African American Museum in Los Angeles and the Peoria Riverfront Museum in Peoria, Illinois for helping us to define today's topic develop the framework for our conversation and sort out all the logistics. We're also grateful to eight other affiliate partners, um, including History Miami in Miami, Florida, the Indiana, Indiana Historical Society in Indianapolis, the Museum of History and Industry in Seattle, the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee, the North Carolina Museum of History in Raleigh, the Northwest Museum of Arts and Culture in Spokane, Washington, the Springfield Museums in Springfield, Massachusetts, and the Western Reserve Historical Society in Columbus, Ohio. Working with all of these partners, we can collectively serve many more people than we could with a single in-person program. And we're able to start a conversation not with just one community, but across 10, which is really exciting for us. Um, though the program was prompted by the new normal brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, we're excited about the opportunities that digital programming like this offers the Smithsonian and most importantly, all of you joining us today. Of course, because this is the first time we've offered a program like this, it may not be perfect. Um, we view this as a pilot and an opportunity to learn and inform future online programs. We'll be gathering our own lessons learned, of course, but we also welcome your input on how we can tweak and improve future programming. There will be a very short survey at the end of the discussion, and I hope you'll take a moment to complete it to help us shape our future thinking. My colleagues will also post our email address in the chat box now, and we'll show it again at the end of the program if you'd rather connect with us that way. And now I am delighted to turn it the mic over to um, George Davis, um, the Executive Director of the California African American Museum. George? 
Well, good morning and good afternoon, uh, depending on what part of the country you're in. I'm uh, really honored this morning and this afternoon to welcome you uh, to this great lecture by Dr. Damian Thomas. Uh, my museum is the California African American Museum. We're based in the Exposition Park section of Los Angeles. We uh, also have great venues as part of the, the park. So we have the Natural History Museum, you may have seen that in some of the movies, uh, Night at the Museum. We have the California Science Center, the iconic Memorial Coliseum, where we've had two Olympics, the Bank of California Stadium, and we have the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art that's gonna be coming to our park in the next couple of years. Our museum is a state-supported museum. It was founded because the founders were really wanted to make sure that African-American stories of the West, of the journey West, when a lot of people thought of African-American history, they usually thought of the South, Harlem Renaissance, and they didn't think really about celebrities when they thought about uh, California. So our founders really wanted this to be focused, uh, California, a Western museum, and also that we have both art and history. The last few years, we've really made a, an attempt to go for a much younger audience, to be uh, more historically relevant, and to also uh, see the changes in Los Angeles with contemporary art, to make sure that uh, we're, we're part of that because a lot of the great artists that are emerging in the contemporary art space are based in Los Angeles. We have great art schools where a lot of them uh, have uh, participated. As you mentioned, we're a Smithsonian affiliate for the last uh, about five years, and we really enjoy that partnership. It gives us an opportunity to have a great programming. When we get open back from the pandemic, we'll have the Men of Change exhibit at our uh, museum. So we're looking forward to that. Also, when I was thinking about this program and introducing uh, Dr. Thomas, I thought about my own journey watching sports as a young man and most of the athletes that I grew up with didn't really talk about politics. So I remember how big a deal it was in Mexico City Olympics when John Carlos and Tommy Smith uh, raised their fist. And also I think about Muhammad Ali taking his stands, uh, Jim Brown and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So a lot of these things are percolating what, hap what happened uh, with, with Kaepernick in the last couple of years. And so the timing's very good. Also, the timing is great because there's been a great documentary out that many of you might've seen with the ESPN uh, the last uh, few, few weeks, and it, it culminates tonight. Also, I want to mention shortly that we're honored that the secretary of the Smithsonian, Dr. Lonnie Bunch, started his career at our museum as a history curator. So we really appreciate that. And I forgot to mention I didn't uh, go into the chat that I'm a Laker fan and I grew up in Seattle so I was a Sonic fan so uh, I'm disappointed I didn't see many people mention the Lakers when I saw the chat box there. So I'd like to introduce to you our, our guest uh, speaker today is Dr. Damian Thomas, the curator of sports for the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. He earned a PhD at the U in uh, United States History at UCLA, we kind of wish he'd gone to USC, but we understand. Prior to joining the museum, he was an assistant professor at the University of Maryland College Park and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he taught courses that focus on sports, the United States history, sports, and US race relations, and also sports and black masculinity. He is the author of Globetrotting, African-American Athletes and Cold War Politics. He also has several videos online, you get a chance. He's done great TED Talks and others. And we are honored this morning as a California African American Museum and our other affiliates to welcome Dr. Damian Thomas. Thank you. Hi, George. Thank you for that, that warm welcome. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I am uh, really excited for this opportunity. I'm glad that Smithsonian Affiliates has partnered with all of these, these uh, museums to, to uh, make this possible. I, I am um, particularly excited that George was, was uh, asked to introduce me because I spent a lot of time in CAM as a native of, of Los Angeles. And so it's a place that has a, a special place in my heart. Matter of fact, one of the very first exhibitions I saw was the 1984 exhibition devoted to the Olympic Games, and so it's a, it's a special place for me. And the reason I went to UCLA and not USC is because UCLA offered me more money. So that's the, that's the, that was the uh, deciding factor. 
Today, I want to, to think about Michael Jordan and its cultural impact. Um, I, I, I sort of was sparked to do this after watching The Last Dance. I think it's been an incredible documentary series. And what I want to do today is not offer a critique of it, but just offer a different perspective. Um, as a curator, just wanted to, to, to sort of engage some of the aspects of Michael Jordan as I see it. As a curator of sports at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, I've tried to create an exhibition that's, that's not a Hall of Fame, but rather a gallery that uses sports as an entry point to larger political, social, and cultural conversations. And so that's, that's what I want to do today, is to, to think about how we can understand Michael Jordan's impact. And we'll have about 20 minutes, and I'll make, I'll make three arguments. I think one of the, the most important things we have to think about when thinking about Michael Jordan is to think about him from a generational context. Michael Jeffrey Jordan was born on February 17th, 1963. So he was born during the civil rights movement, but he didn't come of age in the civil rights movement. He's in that post-civil rights generation. So one of the interesting things is, is how should we think about people who came of age in the 19, the mid, late, and late 1970s, the 19 or 80s, and maybe even the 1990s, the early 1990s. When we tend to think of that generation or those generations, we tend to think of them in terms of who they're not, the civil rights generation. And the civil rights generation has cast such a huge shadow because of the masses of accomplishments of those who risked their lives fighting to end segregation that all other generations have been compared to them. But I think it's important that we have to think about each generation and, and the struggles that that generation had to face and to fight. And so I wanna start by playing this clip of Martin Luther King Jr. who is speaking on April 3rd, and this is the night before Dr. King A long life, longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Wow, what an incredible passage. Many of us have heard that passage. We recognize it as, as a very prophetic moment. But we also have to think about it in terms of the metaphor that King is sharing there. That, that is King sort of placing himself in, in the shoes of Moses from the Bible. And that, that passage that he's quoting, he's actually quoting scriptures from the book of Deuteronomy. And what happened is that God told Moses that he wouldn't go to the promised land, but that he allowed, he would take Moses up to a mountaintop and allow him to see the promised land before allowing the Israelites to go in to the promised land. And so what we have in that, in that, in that passage is King sort of thinking about himself and in some ways metaphorically 
those of the civil rights generation as sort of like Moses and the children of Israel. And a lot of scholars have sort of taken that, that moment, taken that passage and thought about the next generation and called it the Joshua generation because Joshua is the person that leads people in to the, the promised land. And if we think about what that means in, in the United States, those who come of age in a post-civil rights movement are really important because they become part of the Black middle class. And if you're talking about African Americans um, succeeding, moving into quote unquote, the promised land of America, you're really talking about integration. And more importantly, integration from an economic standpoint. This is a, a cover of Time Magazine from June 1974, the black middle class. And this is an incredible moment because in the post-civil rights movement, we saw tremendous advancements among African Americans from 1967 to 1972. We saw the number of African Americans attending college double. We saw the number of African Americans entering the middle class triple, such that by 1974, 25% of African Americans were considered to be middle class. While the, the Joshua generation isn't a protest generation, it's a generation who saw its mission as a mission to integrate, to succeed, to break down doors, to move through as many doors as you possibly could. And that's the goal of, the gener of that generation and people who are raised in Michael Jordan's time. It's to go as far as your talent and God-given ability can take you. In other words, it's that generation's goal to live the American dream. And in many ways, what they see as their responsibility to Black America, to the country, to those who engaged in the civil rights movement as, 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 a, as an opportunity to achieve. And so this is a generation defined by achievement as its goal. And it's one of the things that Michael Jordan sort of alluded to in some of the earlier, earlier uh, sections of, of The Last Dance. And certainly if we think about Michael Jordan from this standpoint, the idea that the goal of, of his generation is to create as many opportunities for themselves and for others subsequently who come after them, I think Michael Jordan has done a tremendous job. When Michael Jordan was drafted in 1984, it was unthinkable that 30 years later, and let's go to the next slide, that Michael Jordan would become the owner of a team. That's an incredible accomplishment. It's, it's, it's an accomplishment that speaks to his business acumen, his vision, and I think his commitment to the legacy of the civil rights movement. And there's certainly some people, some people's commitment to that legacy is to continue the kind of protest efforts, but other people have decided that, that the best way that they can contribute is to achieve. And I think that's a very important idea that we often, often forget to acknowledge. And so by doing this, what Jordan really has done is raise the bar for what it is that we see as, as possible for African-American athletes. And so I think it's important to think about him from that generational context. Now I wanna shift and spend some time talking about another way that we can think about Michael Jordan, particularly the legacy of Michael Jordan. Uh, Trisha, let's go to the next slide. One of the things that, that's been really interesting to me is this idea of the next Michael Jordan. And on the screen, we see a number of basketball players who've been tagged with that label as the next Michael Jordan. Grant Hill, Jerry Stackhouse, 
Harold Minor, who even had the nickname Baby Jordan. Certainly one of my favorite players, uh, Kobe Bryant, Tracy McGrady, Anthony Hardaway, Vince Carter. But I'd like to offer a different name into that conversation, one that we often don't think about. What about this guy, Yao Ming? Let's go to the next slide. Yao Ming is often someone who's not thought about in that conversation as the next quote unquote Michael Jordan for a number of reasons. One, he's not African American, doesn't play guard, not a wing player. Well, unfortunately, Yao Ming never won an MVP or a, an NBA title. But I think Yao Ming has, has almost a great acclaim to the title as, of the next Michael Jordan as some of the other athletes who we think, think fit that role, sort of LeBron James and uh, Kobe Bryant most, most uh, in particular. And that, this idea of Yao Ming as the next Michael Jordan really forces us to go back and think about what was going on as Jordan was finishing his career and what his impact was. Yao Ming really represents the rise of China as a world power. When China allows Yao Ming to come to the NBA in 2002, it was an incredible cultural moment for the world. And it was one in which China used to suggest that it was going to exert its influence all across the globe. And it was no happenstance that basketball was, was one of the ways in which they decided to announce that they were ready to become a world superpower. It's also interesting if you consider this moment in time in the NBA, where a number of foreign players were getting drafted incredibly high in the NBA draft, including Paul Gasol, who was drafted with the third pick, Darko Milicic, the number two pick, Andrew Bogut, number one, Andres Bargnani, number one, Hasim Thabit, number two, Ricky Rubio, number five, Enos Cancer, number three. And that's all within about a five-year period. And so what the NBA was trying to do at that time was to create, to recreate the magic that they had created with Michael Jordan, who joined the 1990s, elevated the international profile of the NBA through his basketball talent, certainly through the dream team, a lot of his commercial appeal. And what the NBA was hoping to do was to create these stars like Yao Ming, who they could then market back to their country as symbols of, of uh, America in some ways, or the, the way that America embraces foreign audiences. And it was designed to be a place where you could, could sort of leverage the brand of basketball to open markets and create spaces for all American companies and products as well. This is an incredible, moment that we have to think about. And it's often one that gets under acknowledged with Michael Jordan, that he's a symbol of globalization and a symbol of opening markets. Let's go to the next slide. And this is also really important as well, because it really transforms the power relationships between athletes and the leagues themselves. In 1998, Michael Jordan made $33 million as a basketball player, but he made $42 million as a product endorser. And so what that did is that gave him a little bit more power than he would have had otherwise. It gave him a visibility that transcended basketball. And this would become a, a model that not every other athlete could, could embody. It became a, a model that elite athletes could sort of follow. And we see that play out over and over as, as the new generation of superstars came into the NBA.
So I think it's important to think about Jordan, not just as a player, but as a, as a, as a global brand who has transformed how we think about sports. I want to play this commercial because I really think it speaks to the significance of Michael Jordan as a brand and as an identity. One of the things that Sometimes I dream that he is me. Got to see that's how I dream to be. That's an incredible, incredible commercial. It's one of my favorites. And if you look closely, you see that it's a Gatorade commercial, but you never hear about any of the attributes of Gatorade. You never hear about any of its qualities. All you see and hear about, Mike, are about Michael Jordan. And what happens in this sort of relationship is that companies benefit because they are identified and affiliated with Michael Jordan. In the old days of advertising, you would have an, a, an athlete say something like, I use this phone because it's the best phone on the market. And so what happens in the old relationship is that athletes take their influence and transfer it to the object. Michael Jordan helps reverse that relationship where what happens is that the brands decide to sell the athlete, in particular Michael Jordan, and then the brand reaps the benefit because they're associated with the athlete. I think that's a very important shift in marketing. Also, I think it's important to think about Michael Jordan's partnership with Nike, which is also really transformative how he moves from being an endorser to a partner. And now we're starting to see that become the norm among athletes who have moved beyond doing endorsement deals to doing partnership deals. And I think that's another, another important way to think about how Michael Jordan becomes transformative and empowers athletes in important ways. Let's, uh, let's go to the next, the next photo. This is one of the most famous images in American sports history. This is Muhammad Ali meeting with Jim Brown, Lou Alcindor, who later changed his name to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bill Russell, Paul Stokes, the mayor of Cleveland, Bobby Mitchell, and a bunch of other prominent athletes. This is shortly after Ali refused to step forward. And these athletes are there to meet with him, to, to hear why he was unwilling to go to Vietnam. And ultimately they issue a statement of support. I think this is a, an important issue, an important moment that we often hear about. I also think it's important, and this is the third thing I'll say about thinking about thinking about a larger social context for Michael Jordan, is that this moment takes place within a larger context, the Black Freedom Movement. And for some of you may be familiar with that, over the last couple of years, historians have sort of largely stopped talking about the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Power Movement as separate movements. But now we're starting to see how these two movements are probably more alike than they are dissimilar and so use the black freedom movement to talk about the legacy of uh, the 1950s, 60s and early 70s 
in a combined way. But we certainly see the activism of the 60s, the sit-ins, the marches, the protests, even the rioting in 67 and 68 in earlier parts of the, the 1960s as, as creating a climate for athletes to become involved. And here's the key point that I wanna make is it's that athletes don't start social revolutions. They respond to them. And so what happens is that you get the masses of people out in the streets, protesting, advocating, and then athletes see that, that they can become involved. And what athletes do most effectively in moments of social crisis is to help amplify and to, to nationalize conversations around race and sports, or excuse me, around, around social injustice. I'm gonna to go to this next slide. Here's an image of LeBron James in many of his various forms of activism and engagement. And it's very easy for us to see the, the line between athletes and the black power movement, excuse, excuse me, athletes in the black lives movement in the contemporary moment who are now playing a role drawing attention to social injustice and the athletes from the 1960s. But often what we forget is the role of Michael Jordan in this particular space because what we see from the 1960s is a political engagement. What we see from Michael Jordan is an economic engagement. And that's important because now we see in this new generation where a number of athletes are able to combine the two at the same time. You're able to be politically engaged. You're also able to, to extend your economic well-being and your ability to do well for others, particularly in basketball. And I don't think it's, it's happenstance that basketball is sort of far outdistanced the NFL in terms of creating these opportunities for athletes to be both socially engaged, but also building economic empowerment movements as well. And so I know our time is coming short. I wish we had 10 episodes like The Last Dance, but I just wanted to use this time to provide you with three points to talk about in terms of Michael Jordan. One, thinking about him from a generational context, two, thinking about him from a global context, but also thinking about how he fits in to the world of activism among athletes in ways that we often don't think about. I'm really looking forward to the question and answer period, and um, I can't wait to hear what you think. Thanks, Damian. That was so great and so 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 interesting. And I think the last point that you ended on um, reflects so much of what's in the comments and the questions. I'll just remind you that you can still be using the Q and A box and the chat box to pose questions and comments for Damian, but a lot of them have to do with social activism. Um, and, you know, actually, you know, Denise posed the question, you know, did, did Michael Jordan do enough for others? You know, um, his actions opened doors for others, but did his words? Um, I'm curious to know what you think about that. I think in terms of Michael Jordan's words, I, I, I haven't seen that be one of the primary ways in which he's decided to make a contribution. Um, and, and I think while other people might make a, a different choice, um, I also think the last point that I was trying to make is really important and significant because we've had a lot of athletes sort of come out and sort of say things about social justice issues, but really in the absence of a large mass movement, those comments tend to not really have that much impact. 
And so one of the things I've tried, really tried to argue is that if we want athletes to do more, we as the masses have to do more. And what happens is that then they come in and play a particular role, usually as a town crier that helps elevate the conversation. But I, I, I'm not convinced that athletes speaking in a vacuum has really been socially beneficial. Or I won't say beneficial, I will say transformative. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things when we were talking earlier this week in preparation for this program was you commented that, you know, with social media and technology, you know, athletes can tweet, but tweeting isn't necessarily, I don't know how you put it. I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it was, you know, tweeting is an activism. It is an act, but it's not actually changing anything. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. I, I think Twitter's great and it, and it provides a space for people to have conversations and to engage, but we also have to realize that, that, that that's what we're doing on Twitter and online is having conversations. Um, but it's not an act. It's not an act of resistance and activism to be engaged in a conversation. And I, and I think it's important to distinguish those. Yeah. Um, so there are a number of questions along these same lines, but I think we'll address a couple other issues. And then if we have time, maybe we can come back and think about this idea of social acti activism. Um, so Miriam poses the question, if Jordan is part of the Joshua generation, what do you see as the focus of the current generation? You know, as a historian, I tend to like to wait 10, 20 years to have a comment. You know, I, I heard someone say not too long ago that, that Colin Kaepernick, the football player who took a knee, is the rose of parts of his generation. And while I think that's an interesting parallel, it really depends on what happens next. You know, it, it, it could be that we sort of, 10 years from now, look on Colin Kaepernick's kneeling and saying, wow, that was courageous. Or we could look and see, wow, that was transformative. It depends on what's happened. And one of the things about, about the Black Lives Matter movement, and, and sometimes it's weird when you're in a movement, you often don't think that things are moving fast enough or, or you're sort of agitated, particularly with the recent things that we've seen um, with the police in Louisville and other parts of the country, some of the ways in which you get the crackdowns around COVID-19 disproportionately impacting people of color. But what people have been able to do with the prison system, you know, people working on bail reform, working on nonviolent uh, offenses and things like that, there are things happening and people are agitating and advocating. Um, how we see Colin Kaepernick um, 10, 20 years from now actually really is not going to have anything to do with Colin Kaepernick. It's going to be about what we decide to do as a society. And I think that's important to remember. Yeah, great points. Um, so another question is about the influence of Michael Jordan's parents. You know, his parents, especially his father, seem to have huge um, influence over him and his decisions. Um, and the questioner was sort of comparing that to um, Dennis Rodman, who didn't, as far as we know, have that same kind of influence. Can you comment on the dynamic and the influence of Jordan's parents? I, I, I would feel less comfortable kind of doing that because I, I haven't had a chance to, to, to meet um, I, either of his parents. And so I, I don't know that I'm the best person to, to, to answer that question. Fair enough. Um, just an interesting comment um, from Marguerite in the chat. Um, she said she was living and working in Shanghai during 2008 when China was preparing the 2010. China was preparing for the 2010 World's Fair, and Yang, Yao Ming's photos were plastered all over the cityscape, along with construction cranes and building scaffolding. It was a powerful justification, juxtaposition, and harbinger of the future of the country. So, just kind of an interesting. Um, comment on your inclusion of Yao Ming in your presentation. Um, let's see, Michael posed a question. Um, 
or a comment, what I like about Michael Jordan is that he's competitive with himself, but that he pushed others around him to rise to their best, like Scottie Pippen, Dennis Rodman, Steve Kerr. I think that's important. You know, I, I, I've heard a lot of media outlets, Michael Jordan saying that, you know, he's, he's a bit wary of how this documentary will make him, him look. Will he seem to be too competitive, too, too sort of driven? Um, and and I, I mean, I think what you see is his tremendous will to win. Um, and, and I thought the line was really effective. I didn't ask anyone to do anything that I wasn't, wasn't willing to do. And I think, you know, sometimes people help you reach your greatness. I wonder if some ways, if Scottie Pippen maybe gets drafted by another team, you know, he's a great player, but does, would he have reached the heights that he reached? And that's the thing, you know, sometimes you have to, you have to build teams around your best players. And so it's, it, it's a situation where it seemed like Michael Jordan and the Bulls really had to be, be um, diligent about the type of people that they paired with Michael Jordan in the sense that people were willing to, to do whatever it took to, to succeed. And that's part of creating a culture of success. It often is not pretty. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I know. I, I think that, you know, he, like it or not, had incredible leadership abilities and you might not appreciate his style of leadership, but I think that was really evident in the way he guided his team. Um, there's a question you touched briefly at the end of your presentation that basketball has been the sport that has been the one that has been most vocal. Do you have an insight why is basketball as opposed to football or baseball or any other sport? I think... You know, some of it comes from the, the league as well in the league's sort of perspective. I think the NBA recognized early on that it would go as far as its star players could, could take them. And so the NBA has been very much about creating individual stars. I think the, the NFL by, by uh, the, the NFL's approach has been that no one is bigger than the Shield. And so I think the league office often is much more, much more um, concerned, the NFL league office, with providing a top-down approach, whereas the NBA has really been much more open to allowing things to rise from the bottom up and to allow the players to, to kind of lead the league um, in places that sometimes it might not have been comfortable going but in places that, that were important to the players. And so I think it's, it, it's the fact that, that you have a strong partnership between the players and between um, the, league, the league offices. And I, th I think that, that that really shows up in, in the NBA more so than the other sports. Great, and there's, um, this is I think a great uh, question from Chase. There's an ongoing GOAT debate, greatest of all times debate. The dominant players in the discussion are Kobe, LeBron, and Michael. Um, not looking at their stats, but at their off-court actions, who do you believe is the GOAT of movements? Of movements? That's, that's a tough tough thing to say, particularly because we're still in the middle of the LeBron James era. It's amazing all of the things LeBron James is able to do while still playing. Um, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Um, we'll see what he does when he retires. I, I, I don't know that, that, that we can say. And it often depends on, on what the masses do and how he participates in that. Um, I, I just don't know that we, we know yet. Um, LeBron James in some ways feels like he could, he could be president. Um, and, and we just don't know. We just don't know what, what um, he's gonna do. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm take a pass on that. But, but if you allow me to talk about the greatest in terms of basketball on the court, I like to comment on that. Can I do that? Sure. <laughs> I, I think, I think there are two eras of basketball. 
One is where the big man was the dominant player and then where the, the guards and wings are the dominant players. So up through the 1980s, mid 1980s, most of the championship teams are dominated by, by um, centers and power forwards. Since the mid eighties, we've seen a number of guards and forwards, the, Larry, the Dr. J's, Larry Bird's, Isaiah Thomas, um, Michael Jordan, Steph Curry sort of dominate with the occasional big man still kind of winning the the Tim Duncans and Shaquille O'Neal's. So I really think you've got to think about it in terms of two eras. And if I had to say during the big man era, maybe it's because I'm from LA, I'm kind of partial to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. But in this guard wing era, I think it's Michael Jordan. So that that's my take on who is the, the greatest on the court. Great. Um, that was a great answer. And I really liked your answer to the original question because I think you were like spoken like a true historian. We just need more time. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll take just a couple more questions. This is so fascinating. And there are just so many great questions and comments in the chat. Um, let's see, we have one. A column in today's New York Times argues that Jordan's leadership style could have hurt the Bulls nearly as much as it helped. Do you think his leadership style is outdated or is he being evaluated differently due to the fact that he's a person of color? I think when it, when it comes to, to leadership styles, you know, the 80s and 90s, things seem to be a little bit different, different these days in terms of what's considered to be appropriate coaching styles, what's um, considered to be appropriate leadership leadership styles and how do you kind of train and get people ready to accomplish things. Um, let's be clear, Michael Jordan wasn't always the nicest guy. Um, but I also don't think that he was malicious. But sometimes you got to figure out if this is the person I want to go, I want to go to battle with. And you have to find that out. And part of it is, is sort of testing people. Um, do I think that, that, that some of the critique is, is racialized? I don't. And part of it is Michael Jordan's pedigree. This is also really, really part of the issue with Michael Jordan is that he goes to North Carolina. He is, he's part of the Dean Smith School. He's, he's, he plays under Bob Knight in, in the Olympics. And so in many ways, I think Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan is, is part of an elite fraternity of basketball. When you talk about the kind of powerhouses you get, North Carolina, University of Kentucky, and in the olden days, UCLA. And so that kind of in some ways gives you a little bit more rope with a lot of, with a lot of sports fans as well. Great. Um, I think we're going to take two more questions. Um, so Jamil asks, Jordan does not seem to be a beloved athlete like Muhammad Ali or Magic Johnson. What are your thoughts about how Jordan feels he is perceived specifically within the African American community? I think that's a great question. Um, and, and to me, you know, one of the things I've tried to, to, to sort of emphasize in this in this, this presentation is that protest isn't the only avenue to progress. But I think protest, there's something about protest that it, 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 it grabs us because it's active, it's engaged, it's speaking truth to power. Um, I think, I, and, 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 I, and I get why the protest generations um, speak to us often because they are also much more controversial. I, I, I can't speak for Jordan in terms of how he sees himself perceived within the African American community, but it's also one where, you, you know, it, it's also, it'd also be interesting to see what athletes do. Um, after this, because I do think that his legacy is tremendous, particularly in thinking about, about how athletes are now empowered and emboldened, emboldened 
with some of their economic decisions, which then leads to, to some, some sort of social engagement. I should also say this, Michael Jordan is a $5 million donor to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, that's the largest donation that we were got, got from the sports world. Should also say that after he donated $5 million, we probably got another $5 million of donations uh, from, from people, other people in the sports world who are inspired by his gift. And I know Michael Jordan has sort of, over the last couple of years, um, done a number of philanthropic sort of things to, to, to help out others. And so, um, you know, maybe he's entered a different phase of life where he's saying, okay, now this is a moment where I can help in this, this particular, particular way. And mm -hmm. so I think um, his story still remains to be told. Yeah, I think that's such a great point that I think we tend to want to um, understand everything and interpret everything right in the moment, which I think is, is kind of human nature, but the idea that history has a long tail. And so it'll be interesting to see what we're thinking about Jordan in 25, 50, even 100 years to understand his legacy. Um, so one final question, which I think is kind of fun, um, which is what has been your favorite part of the last dance? And I will just add to that. Um, has the watching the last dance, the documentary about Jordan, given you new insights into him or helped your own research in any way? My favorite part of the last dance was, was it was actually a political moment. Um, and, and it was when Michael Jordan responded to this quote that was attributed to him that he said Republicans buy shoes too. And, and for those who are, are unfamiliar with that context, it was, it was a 1990 senatorial campaign. Harvey Gant, who was the mayor of Charlotte, was running against Jesse Helms, who was an old segregationist um, senator who during that campaign ran one of the most racist ads in American history, something called the Hands Ad, the Hands Ad, which sort of played on, on racial tensions in North Carolina at the time. And, and one of the authors wrote that Michael Jordan said that he wouldn't become in this race, become involved in this race because Republicans buy shoes too. And, and that became a huge deal. Um, and a lot of people have referenced that and Michael Jordan had never spoken on that issue as far as I can tell. And in the documentary said I was on the bus and, and I said it, but I was joking. Um, and and I, I wonder about his decision to never sort of correct the record about that or to engage it. Um, in some ways, maybe he felt as if he was in a, a can't win sort of situation. And you kind of see that through the documentary, his tensions with the media who are, you know, looking for the next big story. and. And unfortunately, sometimes, um, you know, you know, we're looking for for the next big negative story. And so, for me, that was a that was a very powerful kind of moment to hear him him speak on that topic. Um, in terms of my own research and thinking about Michael Jordan, how has the uh, how has the book the, the documentary sort of sort of influenced myself? I think. It's just reinforced the work that I do, which is, which is to, to say that sports matter and they matter far beyond the playing field. It really is an important and unique way to enter into these larger political and social conversations. And what we try to do at the museum is we have 12 galleries, but one story. And you never know for the people who come to the museum which gallery, which object, which narrative is going to speak to them. You just hope that there's something that becomes the vehicle through which they can engage these larger issues and subjects. And so for me, it was just, it's just in, in the cultural conversations taking place, just a reminder that the work that we do at the Smithsonian matters and it matters to a lot of people. And so, um, I found it to be encouraging. And I guess that's, you know, sometimes in the COVID-19 world, 
<laughs> you know, you got you to gotta take the, all the encouragement you can get, particularly not even having been in the museum for the last two months. And, and you know, that's, that's been really hard for me. It's a source of joy and pride to be able to just go in the museum and interact with people and not being able to, to have had that opportunity for the last two months um, has been tough. And so thinking about this program and what we're doing at the museum has just been a, a reminder of how significant the work we do at the Smithsonian is. Great, thank you. I think that's a perfect place to leave it. And I have to say, when you were talking about the museum and the power of the objects, to help us think about bigger stories and our place in history. Um, I, I got chills. I mean, it reminds me of why I chose to spend my museum, my career in museums and supporting museums. Um, and I think you're right. The Smithsonian does matter. All of our work that does matter. And I think, um, I think we, I think like you said, you know, sports matter. I think it's easy to think of sports as superfluous. Um, but I think we can see through the documentary and your talk and many other things, the museum and lots of other things, how sports really has um, a much larger role to play in our life than just what happens on the court. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. We, there are so many questions, Damien. I mean, we could be going on for another hour, which I think speaks to the um, power of your presentation and the interesting content that you've presented and the relevance of it. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much to everyone joining us today. Um, our email address and our website are up on the screen now. Please feel free to reach out if you have comments from, for us. Um, this has been recorded. We can um, share a recording, which I have seen a number of questions in the chat. And um, we hope you'll look out for future programs that we'll be doing online in this format. So thank you, Damien. Thank you, George, so much for being with us today. And thank the support of the California African American Museum, the Peoria Riverfront Museum, and all of our affiliates. Um, thank you.